Flow class. Uh, today we're going to be talking about learning and conditioning. So first, uh, what is learning? What do we mean when we say that we are learning something? Well, the definition that I'm going to give you for learning is that learning is the accumulation. And accumulation just means an acquisition or a gathering. So uh, the acquisition, maybe is even a better word, the acquisition of new skills and information through experience. Learning is the acquisition of new skills and information through experience. So there are two main types of learning that uh, I want to talk about. There are more types of learning, but we're really going to focus just on two. The first is probably what you think of when you think of learning, and that is what we call cognitive learning. Now you've seen this word before in class, of course, and cognitive just means uh, thinking. And remember uh, that here thinking doesn't always just mean you know, the words in your head, but actually when we refer to a cognitive learning, we are really talking exclusively about the words in your head. So when we say that you've learned something cognitively, what that means is that you've figured out some information, right? So you learned what 4 plus 4 is, what the answer of 4 plus 4 is, uh, through cognitive learning, right? You remembered uh, that answer. You know your own birthday or you know your mother's birthday uh, through cognitive learning, right? You sort of in took or took in that information uh, and you can call it back up. That's how you learned that. <clears throat> We tend to think uh, of learning primarily as cognitive learning, but there are other types of learning, and in fact, that's mostly what we're going to talk about today. The other type of learning that we're going to talk about is a type of learning called associative learning. Associative, marine, associative learning, uh, or association, really just means that two things go together. So when we talk about an associative learning, this is just learning that two things go together, that two things are associated with one another. Now this is a very, very basic type of learning. In fact, it's a type of learning that we see most organisms able to do. And I'll give you some examples of that here in a minute. Uh, but first, let me say a little bit more about this type of learning. Associative learning, when we say that two things are going to go together, what that basically means is that you learn to expect, and this tends to be in an unconscious way, this tends to be in a way uh, that isn't necessarily cognitive to you, this isn't a way that you're knowing two things go together, this is almost like your body expects it, uh, or at least your mind does on an unconscious level. What's this look like? Well. The very classic example, of course, is Pavlov's dog. And Pavlov's dog is an example of a type of associative learning that we call classical conditioning. Now here conditioning is really just another type of learning. Um, you might think of it almost exactly as associative learning, but uh, they're not exactly the same. The best thing to think about conditioning as uh, is a type of training. And if you've heard the word or even used the word conditioning yourself, you probably uh, think about it uh, not just uh, in terms of your hair, I don't have that problem, uh, but generally in terms of maybe a sport conditioning, right? You go out for the basketball team uh, and the first two weeks are conditioning. Now, because of that, most of the time when I ask the class, of course you're not here, uh, but most of the time when I ask the class, what does conditioning mean, uh, I tend to get answers about it means running laps or it means uh, doing some type of workout, and yeah, that can be conditioning. But the reason we're talking about it and the reason it's related to the conditioning we're talking about today is because it's really about training your body, right? It's training your body to expect the types of things that you would expect in that sport. So uh, if you're a swimmer, for instance, you're going to do a lot of cardio training, right? You want to be able to swim long distances underwater without having to breathe. Uh, and so because of that, you're going to train, you're going to condition your heart to be able to expect those 
uh, type of conditions to be able to work in those type of conditions. Similarly, if, uh, I don't know, you're on the tennis team and you're learning how to, um, I don't know, what would the con tennis conditioning uh, look like? I play, I play tennis, I, I should know, but you might just be doing some type of shoulder workouts or some type of uh, arm workouts to get your shoulders strong for serving uh, and for hitting you know, different shots. So in that sense, right, conditioning just means training. And so we can really think about that word conditioning uh, just meaning training if you need uh, to, to think about it that way. You might also, again, if it's helpful, think about it as a type of learning. So Pavlov's dog has this really famous experiment that he does uh, with regard to classical conditioning. Now classical conditioning is about learning that two things go together in such a way that when one happens, you expect the other. Now again, this expectation is physical, is unconscious to you. It may also be conscious. You may also cognitively uh, expect something, but generally you've taught yourself through that associated learning, right? You've taught yourself, because I'm expecting this thing physically, I can feel myself get excited, I can feel myself get nervous, whatever it is, right? You sort of untangle, oh, that means that mother-in-law's coming over. I don't know. But in Pavlov's case, uh, Pavlov was a physiologist, right? He had these dogs, uh, and he wasn't trying to do the experiment that he became most famous for uh, on purpose. In fact, he had these dogs just as kind of lab animals. And so one of the things that he noticed when he would go in to feed his dogs uh, every day is that his dogs would start to get worked up even before he brought the food in. Now, if you have a dog yourself, or a cat, or fish, hell, well, you, you know that this happens, right? You know that when you go to get the bag of food that you're going to feed your dog with, uh, he gets excited, right? He can tell that, you know, it's, it's food time, even if you just touch his bowl or you go into the room uh, where you, you generally feed him. This might also work for a cat, of course, in those same ways, but even fish, right? You open the lid to your fish tank. If you've ever had uh, fish, you open the lid to your fish tank and they all swim to the top, right? They have this expectation because they associate the opening of the lid with foods coming. And so Pavlov figured this out, or he at least noticed this and devised an experiment to figure out what was going on. Because and let me say, right, before that, we only thought about cognitive learning. We, we thought that only humans would be able to expect such things because we'd be able to tell ourselves, hey, this thing is about to happen, and so I need to get, you know, excited, I need to get prepared, I need to get nervous, whatever it is. Uh, but in fact, you know, that's putting the cart before the horse. Again, really what tends to be happening in those situations is that you've gained a physiological or at least an unconscious expectation of the events that are occurring or about to occur. And you tell yourself, oh, I'm nervous because of this. I'm excited because of this, right? You are explaining that excitement. You're explaining that expectation rather than just knowing it. But before, right, this is sort of, you know, the, the sun revolves around the earth kind of thing, right? Humans just thought, like, well, how come other animals uh, can expect things? How come other animals, uh, without being able to tell themselves that the food's coming when uh, he walks through that door, seem to know that the food is coming? And so Pavlov puts this little experiment together, famously known as the Pavlov's dog experiment. He starts out by feeding his dog, right? Now this is something he's gonna have to do uh, anyway, but he brings in uh, food. But after a couple of takes of this, right, after he starts the experiment and just says, okay, well, this food's gonna come in. Uh, next, he rings a bell. He starts ringing a bell before the food comes in. So at first, he rings this bell, and nothing happens, and then he brings the dog's food in, and they get ex excited as usual, right? If they got excited when the bowl was coming out or whatever, they got excited at that, uh, that usual time. But he would just keep doing this, right? He kept just ringing a bell, and then feeding them, and then ringing the bell, and then feeding them. So here at first, 
Here at first, we've got what's called a neutral stimulus. Now, a stimulus is something that causes a response. So the answer to what is a stimulus? Well, it's something that causes a response and vice versa. What's the answer to what is a response? Well, it's something that's caused by a stimulus. Okay, so it's just cause and effect here. But a neutral stimulus, right, it's kind of an oxymoron. This is a stimulus that's supposed to cause a response, but doesn't. I'm neutral to that stimulus. Neutral stimulus is what this bell is when Pavlov first introduces it. When he first pairs the bell with the food, it's neutral to them. They're like, yeah, okay, bell, <laughs> where's the food? But what about the food? Food is also a type of stimulus. We call this an unconditioned stimulus. Now, if you remember from the idea of what conditioned mean, right, means it means training, right? So unconditioned just means this is an untrained stimulus. And here when we say untrained, we don't mean unlearned. We mean it didn't have to be trained. You kind of just showed up knowing how to do this. You showed up reacting to the stimulus without us having to teach you to be reacted to, to react to. So the food here is an unconditioned stimulus. Where the bell is a neutral stimulus, right? The bell, eh, never heard of a bell, doesn't really excite me, it doesn't make me do anything, right? And so where the bell is the neutral stimulus, the food is an unconditioned stimulus. Here's a stimulus that, well, I, I know what that means. That means I can eat that. That means I'm hungry. Then. I like that. Can you bring the food in, please? So the food is this other type of stimulus. It's an unconditioned stimulus. So what you have here is a pairing of a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. You put those two things together and you're beginning to form classical conditioning. So what happens here? So we need to look for some type of response to, to make sure that the, the food is having some effect, right? That the food is, in fact, an unconditioned stimulus. Now, the dog might get excited, but, you know, we can't read the dog's emotions. We can read his behaviors. So we could, for instance, look for a tail, tail wag. Uh, but tail wags can mean a lot of things. Sometimes it means the dog is nervous or maybe he is excited, but we don't know what he's excited about exactly. And so what Pavlov decided to go with was saliva, salivating. That the food, as an unconditioned stimulus, should cause salivation. That is, a response. This unconditioned stimulus should cause a response of salivation. Because we don't have to teach the dog to salivate to food, this is also an unconditioned response. And so this unconditioned stimulus causes an unconditioned response. So here's the first step in the classical conditioning. I take a neutral stimulus, I pair it with an unconditioned stimulus, and I let the natural response occur, the unconditioned response. So what's gonna happen here? Right, what, here's the whole thing, right? We're talking about learning. 
And of course, what Pavlov is trying to get the dog to do is to learn to expect the food when the dog hears the bell. And so eventually, what you get happen, after some time, is the bell alone without having the food have to occur, right? Again, this is after several times of bell food, bell food, bell food, right? And letting the dog have his natural response. Eventually what you'll see occur is that the bell itself, even if we didn't bring the food in, or before the food shows up, right? Here, we're waiting for the food to show up before we see the dog salivate. But what Pavlov noticed was that, eventually, the dog started to salivate just to the sound of the bell. That they'd start to salivate early. They'd start to expect their food. These are spit marks, if that's not clear. So at the, at the point where this stimulus, that was neutral, causes a response. At the point that the once neutral stimulus causes a response, well, it's no longer neutral anymore. Now it's causing a response, so we can't call it a neutral stimulus. We also can't call it an unconditioned stimulus because it didn't know what to do with this at first. We, in fact, did have to train it to respond to this bell. And so this is what's known as a conditioned stimulus. So when the bell itself, that is a once neutral stimulus, causes a response, it's moved from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. The dog had to learn, the dog had to be trained to react to this bell with this response that we now call the conditioned response because this response because this response had to be trained into the dog that is to say the response to the food responses excuse me the response to the bell responses don't occur on their own right um, that I know of, I've never heard of a neutral response. Uh, if you know one, that sounds like a good thought paper. Or if you look it up and find something. But here we have a conditioned response, which is to say it's a response to a once neutral stimulus, a now conditioned stimulus. So when thinking about the different types of conditioned stimuluses and responses and unconditioned stimulus and responses, it might be helpful to use this little four by four matrix. We are thinking across the top about the two conditioned conditions, <laughs> if you will. So conditioned and unconditioned. And then along the sides, you're thinking about the difference between the stimulus and the responses. Right, so that you end up with both a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus and a conditioned response and an unconditioned response. Of course, we do have to think about that neutral stimulus as well. Of course, that eventually goes away uh, if we're using it for some type of conditioning purposes. Uh, so I just wanted to also you know, note a couple interesting examples. I will leave some links uh, down in the description of some interesting things that I would usually show in class. Uh, some funny stuff of folks using uh, conditioning against their roommates and, and such. Uh, in, in previous classes, uh, some students have done some of these things with their you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, roommates. 
uh, all of you are at home now, so um, if you're interested and daring enough, maybe uh, try something out on your family. Now, don't hurt them, but uh, you know, maybe have a little bit of fun. You'll see what I mean uh, if you check out some of the links here in the description. Um, but one thing I would say that I think I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture is that even very basic organisms seem to be able to learn this type uh, of associative learning. Now, plants are a great example of this, and the most uh, maybe well-known example is if you take a plant, right, and you put it in the corner of your room, well, the leaves are going to start to face outwards in order to face the sun. This is just a type of associative learning. This is a type uh, of classical conditioning, in fact, where the leaves are coming to expect uh, that the plant, excuse me, the leaves are coming to expect that the light is going to come from a certain angle. I just thought of something and I want to take back that I said that it's a type of classical conditioning. It's actually a type of operant conditioning, uh, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. But just that type of associative learning is still pretty remarkable for something that we would think of as pretty, pretty simplistic or as simplistic uh, as a plant. Uh, plants also do this in, in, in another way that's pretty remarkable. They do this underground. Uh, plumbers and landscapers have talked about uh, the fact or have known for a while that uh, if you got like a water line underneath your house or running through your yard that uh, plant vines, usually grass and other such uh, things, will wrap themselves around uh, this, this pipe, right? You're trying to get at the water or trying to at least get uh, to the constant condensation that's surrounding the pipe itself. Well. You know, this is one of those things uh, that, that's kind of fascinating where, you know, industry folks, folks who are actually doing the work, know about something and it's, you know, passe uh, to them, but scientists think it's like, whoa, holy shit, you know, you're telling me that plant roots <laughs> wrap around uh, pipes? And the reason it's, it's interesting to a scientist is it's, it, it brings up the question, how do they know to do that? How does a plant know where a water line is? And so a few scientists set up in some experiments where they tried to test out how these plants were figuring out where this water was coming from. Uh, and what they did was they took a plant and they put under it sort of this false, you know, underground environment with, um, I believe, some soil, but also a, a pipe running through it. And they did a few things uh, to try to see what was going on. Uh, and the first example, what they did was they just put some water around the pipe. Uh, they just made it so that the pipe was wet and yeah, some plants came that way, but uh, it didn't seem that the pipes were, that they were just sort of finding water, that they were just able to kind of sense pockets of water. It didn't seem uh, to be the way that the plants were finding out uh, where this water was. They also didn't seem uh, to be able to find it due to different temperature changes. But what they did find was that if they took a pipe, and even if they didn't run water through it, if they played the sound of water running through the pipe, that the, that the roots of the plants would seek out that pipe and wrap themselves around it. It turns out that plants have conditioned themselves to find water by the sound of it flowing. Now, why would they need to do this? If you just think about from an evolutionary perspective, right? Like pipes didn't evolve alongside plants, but rivers did. And so you might expect, and this is just my own conjecture here, you might expect that the reason that plants can find water in this way is because that they have been evolved or that they've evolved to be able to find <clears throat> water underground via rivers and different lakes and springs and that type of thing. So um, that's uh, classical conditioning. Um, again, the most important pieces, conditioned stimulus, conditioned response, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, pairing those two things together, right? Pairing one thing with another thing such that you expect uh, that something is going to show up, right? It's the type of uh, occurrence that you might see if, <clears throat> uh, what's a good example of this? Um, I don't know, you're home now. What's something that you expect to happen? Uh, maybe leave this in the comments, let me know that you're watching. What's something that you expect to happen every time your parents get home? And how do you know they're home? 
What's the thing that lets you know they're home? Is it just them walking in the door and announcing themselves? I bet that you've got some other way to know their home, maybe the sound of their keys and being able to tell your parents apart, or maybe the sound of their car, or where they park, or uh, it's that time of the day and so many showing up, it's got to be such and such, right? All of these things are types of things that you've learned through association, not necessarily that you've said, oh, it's 5 o'clock, mom always shows up at 5, or mom's keys have this particular jingle that I can't describe with words. Anyway, uh, I'll see you next time. Uh, don't forget to get those thought papers in, and uh, your test is still due if you haven't turned that in yet. I uh, hope you're staying safe and healthy. I'll see you next time.